The following is an analysis, interpretation, and summary of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. This book can be summarized quite well into one sentence. The quality of our habits determine the quality of our lives. Do your habits support and build you or diminish and slow you? Are they catabolic or are they anabolic? Are they building or are they destructive? Those who are familiar with me know that I don't spend the hundreds of hours that it takes me to invest in analyzing a book if it's just average. If you're familiar with me and seen the books that I've summarized, know that some of the ones behind me, there's quite a few behind me which I've read, almost all of them. I don't have time to analyze every book, but this one in particular, I felt I needed to. Like the lessons, the light bulb moments, and the profundity that this book provides in not just theory, but practicality of the psychology of how to unwrap, untangle, and take advantage of our own brain so we can work for us instead of against us? How can we build constructive habits? How can we untangle destructive ones for ourselves, for the people around us, for our clients? Like this is a now mandatory reading and recommended reading for all my new clients because when we talk about behavior change, we're all trying to do that, right? We're all trying to implement behavior change at some level. And so this book serves an, I think, an incredible framework into doing that. And so it's like, who is this book for? I feel like this is a book. This is one of those books like How to Win Friends and Influence People, like 48 Laws of Power, that it's like a, it's a foundational pillar book for human beings because we're all humans and we all have modulate our behavior accordingly on a day-to-day basis. We all have habits, whether we are aware of them or not. And so how can we get them to work for us? Because they really serve as the basis and underpinning of a lot of the progress, success, and potential that you and we and I can have in this life. And so I'll be going off my notes here in the summary here. The habits are the backbone of any pursuit of excellence. The less energy and more time we spend on trivial decisions, the more we can spend on what really matters to you. And so we should understand that bad habits repeat seldom because you don't realize or want to change. Most people realize and want most people. They have the awareness that they probably should change. Now, there might be some denial or cognitive biases mixed up in there. But because you have no or an ineffective system and environment to change, change becomes very difficult. Or it doesn't happen at all. So that's a short introduction. And now we're just going to go straight into the habit framework that we all interact with on a day-to-day basis. So for those who have studied psychology, um, know, uh, operating, know of operating conditioning, uh, B.F. Skinner. And he cited three steps to a habit or a behavior. The stimulus and cue, the response, or, and then the reward. So we've all interact with this on a day-to-day basis. We get cued by something. The sun could come up. What does that trigger to do? Response, open the blinds, open the curtains. Reward, light. Very simple. Every Almost every, every single behavior we have has this type of mechanistic loop. Now, what James purports, and we should get be clear that James is just standing on the shoulder of giants like B.F. Skinner. Like I think James just did an incredible job at summarizing the psychological framework and behavioral framework that we can interact with like because this is a relatively new-ish book i believe in the last 10 years and so people i know are quite critical of like newer books like all the wisdom is in old books and i think yeah uh, a lot of it is most of it is in fact however there is something uh, very valuable about people who can summarize and distill the multiple textbooks and professionals who have come before us and put it in one text. It's funny because that's what I try and do with these books, with the videos, because there's like, 
listening and watching and is a different type of interaction. A lot of people are more visual than they are auditory or than they are able to interact with pick up a book. So that's how you know I kind of engage with this. It helps me learn. But let's talk about James's four-step habit framework. And there won't be a lot of graphics like my previous videos because they just take a very long time to do unless someone would like to volunteer for that or until I become wealthy enough to invest in thousands of dollars to invest in a really great video editor. This will just be uh, the education, knowledge and summary. So, And I'll put the occasional graphic up on the screen, but for those listening. Four-step habit framework. Q, but the extra one that James puts in is craving. It's the thing that arguably be of skin and mist and it's this in between when you get cued to do something there is this craving in between there is this uh desire you know buddhism says that the root of all suffering is in desire you know and that's something that uh talk about in sapiens uh, the book sapiens which i definitely also aim to do and summarize as well another incredible book so stay if you want to be apprised on those things you you can uh, follow this content and you will see it eventually. So, Q, craving, response, reward. So, we should all just understand, number one, that framework, okay? And understand that this is how we all interact with our behavior on a day-to-day basis. What are you craving? What do you, what's getting, what's cueing you? And what are you then desiring? Uh, and how is it impacting you? We'll dive into that. But chapter one, the power of atomic habits. So this is the idea of the aggregation of marginal gains, which is searching for tiny marginal improvements in everything you do because it adds up to huge improvement over a long period of time. This is also known as compound interest. Compound interest, the more money that goes into an account with a compounding interest rate, the more that will grow. And the faster rate it will grow, like a snowball rolling down the hill. The same similar thing can be said to our habits. And I will put something on the screen that shows a little bit of an equation of what does it look like if you improve 1% every day? And what does it look like if you regress 1% every day? Because both of them compound. If you're 1% worse or 1% better. Improving 1% isn't particularly notable or noticeable, even half a percent. I think even 1% is a lot, particularly, you know, if, if you're someone who is, you know, exercises or weight trains, it's like one rep extra per week, uh, uh, a 1.25 kilo increment, a, a two pound increase in the mechanical load that you are lifting per week is really good. If you are an intermediate to advanced individual, when the novice, you're going to have a very high rate of uh, progress. But if you're intermediate to advanced and you are hitting that type of progress, that is a very fast rate. Now, that's not compounding because the rate of uh, physiological adaptations uh, plateaus and it slows down as you become more adapted. However, and it, you could probably apply the same thing to you know, other behaviors in a lot of ways. However, just technically, if we just look at getting 1% better, 1% worse, it's very powerful thought and um, idea in the long run. So it's easy to overestimate the importance of one defining moment and underestimate the value of making small improvements on a daily basis. That is what we're trying to do. We're not trying to a lot of people, they want to change themselves and they want to change so many things at once. And the sustainability and uh, ability to stay adherent to that is very low for the majority of people. Sorry, you're not David Goggins. Sorry. Now, you can try and be a like him. But if we just look at psychology and adherence and sustainability, there's a reason why there's only a couple of David Goggins in the world. So, that's to say, small, meaningful improvements on a day-to-day basis can get you there. The slow pace of transformation is why it's so easy to let destructive habits slide and why people often wake up one day with the realization they're fat, they're out of shape, they're broke, they're unsuccessful, they're weak. When we repeat 1% errors day in and day out, 
and we rationalize our excuses in the meantime or we don't notice, we're in denial, we're ignorant, our small choices compound into toxic results. Instead, we must realize a very small shift in direction can lead to a very meaningful change in destination. Who you become. So your habits dictate the meaningful change towards your destiny and who you become. Over the span of moments over a lifetime, these choices determine the difference between who you are and who you could be. This is Jordan Peterson business. This is tapping into your potential by understanding, taking advantage of, and building productive, constructive habits. And I really like this one that James said. He said, your outcomes are a lagging measure of your habits. Your outcomes are a lagging measure of your habits. So we all have habits, right? Whether that's, you know, a body composition change you're trying to make, body fat loss, or, you know, you, you want to become smarter and more intelligent in your field. And, you know, often the results that we look for, they take time, right? But they lag. It's not immediate. Like if you go to the gym a couple times for a, for a couple, like for the first week, you're not bigger or stronger noticeably in that first week because the outcome lags and the same and often can be said for most things in life you know to build good relationships with people requires investment and effort up front often you don't get reciprocation until you give to begin with the reciprocation lags behind another interesting point is the idea of task automation and so, the power, what, like, what's the power of habits? This is another idea, task automation. The more tasks you can handle without thinking, the more your brain is free to focus on other areas. So this is where creating systems comes in place. Systems and intelligent systems and habits free your mind to focus on, on more of the things you care about. A lot of people do a lot of tasks in their day-to-day that they could systematize or automate or outsource and delegate. How much time, energy, and effort could you save to then be productive in other areas? What progress is really like? Habits appear to make little or no difference until you cross a critical threshold. Bamboo takes years to grow its roots underground while at the surface it barely looks like it's growing Then all of a sudden it's a tipping point and the bamboo grows tens of meters in a matter of weeks. You need to cross this critical threshold with each outcome you are trying to create. Each outcome in your life. So this is just putting in a a mental framework that this stuff takes time. Okay? So that there is an ingrained patience that you should assimilate into your identity. Almost like your bamboo. Right? Taking, putting your roots into the ground, establishing good habits. And then, oh, all of a sudden, oh, I've doubled my income. Oh, okay. I, uh... I'm five times stronger than I used to be. I'm five kilos leaner than I was, etc. We call this crossing the plateau of latent potential. Complaining about not achieving success despite working hard is not complaining about an ice cube not melting when you heated it for 25 uh, to 31 degrees Fahrenheit. Your work is not wasted, it's just being stored. All of the action happens when you hit 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, where that's when the ice begins to melt. That's the plateau of latent potential, the, the critical threshold. Often people give up just before this critical threshold, when your ice just begins to melt, when you finally break through that plateau. And that's when people call them, call people overnight success. Hey, over, look at that, just all of a sudden. Hanging around all these successful people, making a lot of money. He's he he, he he's fulfilled. He has meaning, you know, uh, helping a lot of people. Man, but it's the work you did a long time ago when no one was watching, when you didn't feel like you wanted to do it, when you didn't really notice much progress. That's what makes the overnight success possible. Master and excellence necessitates. Patience. So you, we got to be, and you got to be like the stone cutter who hammers away at the stone. 
seemingly unchanged, the stone goes until the thousandth hit and the stone breaks. But if you gave up on that 999, stone ain't broke. You don't find the gold. You don't find the diamonds. You should also understand the task of breaking a bad habit is like uprooting a hundred-year-old oak tree from the ground. Its roots are deep and thick. It's going to be hard, difficult, patient work. While building a new habit is like carefully cultivating a seed to grow into a flower. You got to nurture it. You you have to be intelligent. You have to feed it the right environment. And that's going to be be huge. Like that word environment into later chapters, later videos into how do we design an environment for us to be optimally effective and successful and what happens when it's not. Our next key thing is uh, a lot of people set goals. I used to set goals for myself all the time. Every year when I was a teenager, you know, particularly when I was uh, I was an athlete, basketball athlete, wanted nothing more than to play professionally, to earn money and travel the world playing the sport I love. So I set goals, stepping stone goals for me, things that I had to do to achieve the next stepping stone. Oh, and honestly, it's probably one of the biggest mistakes I made in my youth was that I just I just set goals. You know, you, you're told that setting goals is what you should do. You should sit down, you should think about what you want, and you should write it down. You should put a date, you should make it specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, Timely. That's smart, isn't it? Well, yes, kind of, but no, kind of. Because most people just set goals and they put them away and they're done. And they're, and they're just like, okay, uh, well, just, things are just going to happen now, aren't they? Well, no, they're not going to happen. You can work, right? You can then go do work to then progress yourself towards your goals. But what work are you doing? How deliberate is that? And it's not just about the work behind the goals. It's about the systems and the habits. So instead of trying to develop goals first, we should look at developing systems and habits first. Goals are about the things you want to achieve. Systems are about the processes that lead to those results. And a lot of people, they define the carrot stick they're chasing, but they Don't stop to define how they're going to get it. The processes that are most constructive for them to get there. I don't believe in specific goals. I believe in setting up systems. Scott Adams said, set up systems, not goals. Use your judgment to figure out what types of environment you want and can thrive in and then build systems to create that environment so you're statistically more likely to succeed and prosper. Success has less to do with your specific goals you set and more to do with the systems and habits you create that cultivate an environment for meaningful progress and future success. You can have the most specific, objective, measurable goal, but if you don't develop the systems and habits, it's useless. Whereas maybe you don't have an exact specific objective goal, but you know what direction you want to go in. So if you know what direction you want to go in, you can then define some general systems and habits to get you in that direction, to be more effective than having just goals alone. But having both will likely lead to the greatest progress and success. However, if you don't know what you want, but you have a feeling of the direction, systems and goal, consider systems and habits, and what systems and habits you can create. So, like, your goal might be to lose 10 kilos of body fat, eight months, and your system That's your exercise regime. That's your nutrition plan. That's your sleep schedule. That's your recovery plan. It might be a system is like weighing your food. That's a process. So you were looking at process goals now, but I don't even like calling them goals. Call them systems. Like maybe let's get away from uh, body composition and and, and health for a second. Let's talk about money. It's like, okay, you want to make $100,000 a year. Great. It's a pretty good living for most people. You tick a lot of boxes. Well, what uh, what are the systems and habits you need to set up? Okay, well, you probably should start recording your income and expenses, right? You probably should start recording every dollar that comes in and every dollar that comes out so you know your profit margin. 
or your loss margin. Okay, and then what's next? Well, the next system is set a budget. So then you can distribute your income accordingly to investments and savings and to acquire more wealth. Okay, well, it's another system. Well, you could automate money to go into your account and then straight into a mutual fund or into a bank account with savings and a high interest account or a account that is your investment account where you put into investing in people, education. And then you could decide, I'm going to read one new book on business and wealth every month. You see, now we're starting to formulate a well-rounded set of systems to get you to the goal. Where if I just said, hey man, uh, let's make 100K. I want to make 100K in a year. All right, let's just keep working. We'll keep saving money and we'll just keep chipping away at it until we get there. That is so, like, imagine a bucket and you put like 100 holes in the bucket and then you fill it with water. It's going to take you a long... You're going to have to pour a lot of water very fast to fill it up to the top. Like, you get, the rate of, of, of water coming in is going to have to be really high. Well, let's plug the holes. Let's set up good systems. Now make it easier for you to acquire what you want. That is akin to how I think of systems and habits. Goals, they're useful for setting the direction. Systems are, are, is what makes the progress. People typically end up spending way too much time in their goals and not enough time on developing their systems. Focus on the systems that underpin their results and goals to ensure you will get to your goals more effectively. To round this chapter out, we're just going to finish with four problems with goals. One is survivorship bias. Goal setting suffers from survivorship bias, so we focus our attention on the winners, the people who get to the top. And they explain their success through their ambitious goals while we overlook all the people who had the same goal but didn't succeed. Every candidate wants to get the job. Every team wants to win. Every podcaster wants to be popular. If successful and unsuccessful people share the same goals, then the goal cannot be the main driver which differentiates the winners from the losers. It has to be what's underneath it. It has to be the systems and the habits that is a main criterial difference between those who make it and those who don't. If I look back on a lot of the systems and habits I had as a young athlete, I would change so much. My goals was great. My goals were ambitious. I, w- I knew what I wanted. But I didn't have the right framework and structure And it had me wasting a lot of time. I was working really hard, but I wasn't working smart. And that's where intelligent systems and habits come in. So look at the people who are where you want to be. And don't necessarily look at what they have, but look at what they do. And not even what they do now, but what they did. Everybody looks at like The Rock and like, oh man, I want to work out like The Rock. Dwayne Johnson, man, he's jacked and big and strong. You want to look like The Rock, don't do what The Rock does now. Do what he did to get to the place he is now. Maintenance and refinement is a very different process than accrual and building. A lot of people we look at in society and admire, influential, successful people, they're at a maintenance and refinement. They've built their foundation, they've made their wealth, and now... They're in a different place, much, much different place to you. And so their their habits are going to reflect a little bit differently to what it took them to get to that place. Number two, achieving a goal is a momentary change. If you have a goal to clean your room, you achieve it. Okay, you have a clean room now. But if you maintain the same habits that lead to that messy room in the first place, you can be looking at another messy, dirty room again. And you're going to wait for another burst of motivation to fix it up. So you end up chasing the same outcome repeatedly because you never changed the system behind it. You treated the symptom without addressing the cause. This is a big thing we do in our society. We treat symptoms and don't get to the root causes of our problems. So, all right, why is your room so messy? Why does it get messy in the first place? Oh, is it because every time you come home from work, 
you just dump the stuff on the ground. And so after five days of coming home after work, you have five days worth of dumping stuff on the ground. That takes you two seconds to do, to take, take your clothes off, put them on the ground and be done with it. But now that takes you quadruple the amount of time to pick up, fold away, put away. So instead, how can we address that system? Because everybody's interacted with that or knows somebody who's you know not as uh, conscientious with their environment as they probably should be or could be. Well, how about every time you walk past your bedroom, you just put away one thing. So now at the end of the week, it's not some big overwhelming task that is piled up in front of you that you have to dedicate an hour to. No, but it's something you dedicate a minute to every day. You have a minute. I have a minute. I'm just going to put that away. Done. I'm, I'm, I'm going there anyway. I'm on the way there anyway. I might as well. So this is how we can stack habits and systems together. See, the cue is I walk in my room. You know, the craving is, all right, now it's time to put something away because I, I, the craving is, you know, cleanliness. And the reward is feeling like you have a tidy room. So, we should consider that achieving a goal not only changes your life for a moment. We think we need to change our results, but our results aren't the problem. We need to look at the roots instead of at the branches. We need to change the systems that cause those results. Fix the inputs and the outputs will fix themselves. And this is analogous to eating. A lot of people have really poor eating behavior and eating patterns. Understanding what's cueing you into those poor eating behaviors changing that environment so then you can change the inputs and improve the response essentially your health so getting to the root cause of habits and not treating the symptom is a very important note number three goals restrict your happiness people think once I reach my goal I'll be happy implying that the whole process and journey towards the goal is something to dread or not enjoy, and that you should forego joy until you reach the goal. A systems approach provides the antidote when you allow yourself to find joy, meaning, fulfillment in the process. You don't have to wait until this perfect moment of achievement to feel those emotions. The process can serve of, for that as well. But I don't think it necessarily has to as well. Like I don't think happiness is really important um, as a goal, and I don't think it really should be. That's maybe a bit of a, I know it's an unpopular opinion um, in general. Probably one of my most uh, unpopular uh, against the grain opinions. I digress. Number four, goals are at odds with long-term progress. When all of your hard work is focused on a particular goal, what's left to push you forward after you achieve it? This is why many revert to their old habits after they achieve the goal. Why a lot of people who go on the biggest loser, they end up straight bouncing back to their to previous weight, if not heavier. They never, they had a, here's the thing, here's the, here's the crazy thing. They had an environment that was very conducive to radical change, right? You might, you might travel somewhere, your, 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 your habits and systems might improve dramatically. The people you're around, you have accountability, it's amazing. The weather's better, you feel great. You go back to your environment, and all that environment is not there. You never actually designed your environment around you to be successful. Now, unless you move permanently, then you we need to get like those biggest losers contestants could get the most value is like if they sat down with a psychologist or a coach and worked with them. Okay, how can we how can we apply some of these principles here to your environment at home? What's the biggest limitations that you have to cueing you into bad behavior, poor behavior at home? How can we manipulate that environment to work for you instead of against you? Okay, so you leave the bag of chips out on the counter every day. Okay, how about we just put them away out of sight, out of mind? How about every time you bring home your groceries, you put everything away? Way in closed cupboards. Step one. Okay, next. How about we look at replacements for behaviors? So you might cue something sugary. Great, that's fine. How about we look at some intelligent, non-caloric sweeteners uh, like an allulose or a sucralo- uh, or, or a yeah, sucralose or a um, erythritol, and we look at getting those types of sugary, uh, tasting, high palatability drinks with no calories in it. 
And so you look at these things that they aren't telling these contestants, they ain't telling these people, and that people aren't thinking of, and they're just trying to rip the Band-Aid off, and like, I just want to quit alcohol tomorrow and stop all alcohol. Well, maybe you should titrate down. Maybe you should work at uh, getting things that taste like alcohol to replace the behavior first. This is why many revert to their old habits after they achieve their goal. Hence why you need a true purpose and why behind your goals that keeps the fire stoked. You've got to have a deep reason. True long-term thinking is, is goal-less thinking. It's not about any singular accomplishment. It's about the cycle of endless refinement and continuous improvement towards excellence. And so those are the four problems with goals. And so a system of atomic habits... Bad habits repeat themselves again and again because you don't have the effective system for change. You do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your habits and systems. Atomic habits represents the small marginal habits and gains that represent a larger system. Just as atoms are the building blocks of molecules, atomic habits are the building blocks of remarkable results. So that is chapter one, analysis of atomic habits. I will do all the chapters. You can see it on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and all podcast platforms. And if you want to see a lot of the other book analyses that I did, what's the plural for analysis? Analysis that ain't working. Some of them behind me, 48 Levels of Power by Robert Greene, How to Influence and Influence People, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. I have ri- I've accompanied written uh, articles, if you prefer to read, on medium.com or my website, if you want to go ahead and read them as well. This is the fourth book that I'm taking a deep dive into. The next probably will be Sapiens. And then we will see from there. So if you want to stay tuned to that, you guys can follow the content here on all social media platforms. And I'll see you in the next video, Chapter 2, How Habits Shape Your Identity. In this book, Atomic Habits, and what I think is one of the most profound books on human behavior that I've read. Thank you.